off the coast of the Hawaiian island of Oahu. A team of maritime archaeologists is preparing to dive on what they believe to be one of the most important wrecks of the Second World War, the Japanese super sub I-400, a secret weapon that could have changed the course of history. What made this class of sub uniquely dangerous wasn't its crew or its cannons, but its cargo. Three fully functioning attack airplanes that, once surfaced, could launch a surprise attack off the coast of anywhere and vanish in an instant. Initially, submarines were mainly constructed for anti-ship warfare. This really took that next step the submarine to take it right to your opponent's shores and send aircraft in and attack and go back, land on the water, pick them up, put them on there, fold them up, stuff them in the hangar and dive and disappear. And now, 60 years later, this dedicated crew believes they know where the last of these mammoth vessels rests and they are setting out on a quest to find the I-400. The Hawaii Undersea Research Lab, or HURL, is one of the United States' leading deep sea research facilities. It operates two three-man Pisces subs that have made some of the world's most significant oceanographic discoveries. Outfitted with the latest technology, each battery-operated sub can dive for up to eight hours and survive on emergency life support for up to five days. They're out here today to continue a search started almost a decade ago. In 2002, they uncovered the wreck of a Japanese midget sub reportedly sunk in the entrance to Pearl Harbor, just moments before the December 7th attack. We first started targeting these giant I-boats in, um, in 2003. And we finally found the I-401 in 2005 and then the I-14, but the big prize and the first one built was the I-400. The question is, could this be the sub they've been searching for? Okay, okay, Pisces 5, heavy, loud and clear, over. Today's focus lies more than 1,500 feet beneath the surface. As the crew starts to explore, they have no idea what to expect. Pisces 5 is on the bottom, uh, depth 620 meters. When you're on the bottom of the ocean, it's like being in a big cave with a small flashlight. You can only see one little spot at a time and everything else is pitch black. As their small light pierces the abyss before them, the crew follows the path to the sonar anomaly. Something is definitely there. So we had no idea what it was. It could have been a rock formation. And as we started working toward this contact, we got a, a big sonar image and knew it was a big wreck. This is a submarine. This is a submarine. The team is hopeful. They move in for a closer look. And then we came up to a at t communications cable that was going toward the wreck and was going up in the water column. A massive cable was accidentally dropped across this mysterious hull years earlier. As the crew rises, they quickly realize what they've uncovered. The first thing we saw of the sub was a cliff of steel, basically, coming up off the sea floor. And we had to rise above that. It's like it's crumpled and torn here. Yeah. What lies just feet from the submersible six-inch thick window may be the prize that the Hurl crew have been hoping for. The remnants of a revolutionary yet once feared Japanese super sub, capable of unspeakable destruction. The massive hull appears surprisingly intact. The crew can even make out some of the deck gear that made this sub so revolutionary. Uh, we can see the uh, catapult launch ramp and uh, the deck gun. But the team still needs some definitive proof. For all they know, this could just be a similar vessel. These giant I-boats 
or 400 feet long. And even though you know how big they are, it doesn't really prepare you for, for coming up in this massive thing and, and, and running down the hull of this gigantic submarine. It was the height of the Second World War. Germany, along with Italy and Japan, were fighting ruthlessly to dominate the European, Russian, and Chinese armies. The United States' involvement in the war began on December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, nearly decimating the U.S. Pacific Naval Fleet. In response, America joined the Allied forces to combat Hitler and the Japanese. Born from Japan's Admiral Yamamoto's desire to instill absolute fear in his enemies, the I-400 had a preeminent purpose, to be a superweapon that would unite the power of an aircraft carrier with the stealth of a submarine. If built successfully, this machine would redefine the future of warfare. It was, and it did. It was armed with three Siren bombers that could be launched from the surface then recovered and stowed so the I-400 could resubmerge undetected. The 400-foot-long sub carried a crew of nearly 160 men and could launch conventional attacks with eight torpedoes and five machine guns. The I-400 was the largest submarine ever built to that date, and it was new technology for the Empire of Japan. The I-400 specifically that was the real turning point in use of, of submarines for submarine warfare. It was sort of the precursor to the nuclear ballistic submarine. The Japanese planned to build 18 of these super subs, but as steel and time were running out, they only managed to build three. This truly giant I-400 class submarine was capable of surfacing anywhere in the world and launching those strike planes. It had a range of 37,000 miles. The globe circumference is about 24,000 miles. So this could literally show up off anyone's coast. The I-400's first mission was to penetrate the waters off America's east coast and carry out a surprise attack on New York City and Washington, D.C. Knowing the bombers could inflict only superficial damage, Yamamoto's main objective was to inflict psychological wounds that would make Americans think twice about invading Japan and keep the fear of the attack on Pearl Harbor alive. But in 1942, the Americans finally joined the Allies to battle Hitler across Europe, and American forces were fighting wars with two enemies until Germany finally surrendered in May of 1945. Now, the I-400 had a new mission. With the fall of Germany in the wake of Allied forces, Japan knows they are next on America's list. But the United States' only hope of getting more assets to Japan quickly was through the Panama Canal. It provided a straight shot to the Pacific, avoiding going around South America. It was originally going to carry out a strike against the Panama Canal. Japan sends its secret weapon, the I-400, to the Panama Canal in hopes of slowing the Americans down. But they would never succeed. On August 6, 1945, and again on August 9th, America dropped their secret weapon on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the Emperor of Japan sought immediate peace with the Allies. Officially, the end comes at 10.30 a.m. September the 2nd, 1945. On September 2nd, 1945, the Japanese officially surrendered aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay to General MacArthur. With the dropping of the atomic bombs and the surrender of the Japanese, the I-400 super subs never accomplished a single mission before the war ended. The sub's complete failure to have any impact on the Pacific War was felt strongly by their captains and crew. Two of the three vessels ditched their planes and torpedoes before surrendering. But there was still one remaining menace floating beneath the sea. On August 28, 1945, after being spotted by an American fighter, the USS Blue 
and USS Mansfield secured the remaining submarine, the I-400, and its entire crew, and raised the American flag. The very first time the Americans had seen or even learned of the existence of the I-400 submarine class was during its surrender and it proved to be one of the most sophisticated military weapons ever designed and far more advanced than anything the Americans had envisioned for a submarine. But realizing the potential danger if the I-400's technology ever fell into the wrong hands, the Americans decided to scuttle it off the coast of Oahu on June 4th, 1946. It would have been more surprising at that time if we had not scuttled them, if we had shared that technology willingly. Given the tensions developing over what would become the Cold War in just a short time, we were not going to share that kind of information with the Soviet Union. After being torpedoed, the conning tower and airplane hangar of the I-400 were separated from the main double hull of the sub, creating a huge debris field on the floor of the Pacific. The Hurl team must now confirm the identity of the I-400 piece by piece on the seafloor. Yeah, I can see, I can see part of the floor. Yeah, just a... Yeah, we can make out the fade outline of two zeros. Oh, right over there? Yeah. Right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. The moment they've been waiting for finally arrives. The Hurl team has made a positive identification of the I-400. Its original markings still displayed on the conning tower, 68 years after the ship was sunk. It was a thrill to come across it. And every time we locate one of these wrecks, it's like uncovering one of these historic displays in a museum. Not far from the conning tower, Terry and his team discover the main entrance to the hangar system. Yeah, we found a, a chunk of the top of the hangar. At 122 feet long, with a diameter of 11 feet, and able to fit not only a full crew, but also three attack planes in its hangar, it truly was a first of its kind in submarine technology. That was a huge hangar. You could definitely park a sub inside of this. The challenge with creating an underwater hangar system was designing the compact Siren bomber planes that would be stored inside. Not only did three planes need to fit, they also needed to be disassembled and reassembled quickly. The Japanese copied the Grumman Hellcat, which had a rotating and folding wing design for storage aboard American aircraft carriers. With wings that could rotate and fold back 90 degrees, the profile of the planes were almost able to fit. Adding folding stabilizers and a folding fin, the designer achieved their goal and the three bombers fit perfectly. After surfacing, it took less than 45 minutes to assemble all three planes for their missions. Aerial bombers were not the I-400's only menacing weapons of war. It was also outfitted with three 25mm anti-aircraft cannons, a single 25mm auto cannon, eight torpedoes, and a powerful 140 millimeter deck gun with a range of over nine miles. With so much of the I-400 broken apart and scattered on the seafloor, the Hurl team begins the daunting task of scouring and documenting the debris field, a meticulous foot-by-foot -foot process. One of their first findings, the vessel's hangar door. We have, uh, Rachel, we have located the hangar door, over. They go in for a closer look, and what they find is compelling. We found um, each one of the anti-aircraft guns laying on the bottom, that just tore out and were sitting on the bottom. The whole conning tower laying on the bottom, the hangar door, the hangar. So that debris field is, is, is pretty fascinating in itself. There's a lot of stuff there. The I-400 was designed specifically for the hangar and its contents, not necessarily the comforts of its 157-member crew. No air conditioning, no flushing toilets, cramped quarters, and no cold storage for food. Life was brutal for the sailors as they stealthily navigated enemy waters. And now, 60 years later, this wreckage offers a fascinating glimpse into the history of naval warfare. 
you know, there's a lot of skill and there's a lot of luck involved in finding something that, you know, even a big submarine like this, compared to the size of the ocean, is like finding a needle in the haystack. So it's, it's very exciting to find what you were looking for. It doesn't always happen that way. The Japanese super sub I-400, a first of its kind submarine with aerial bombing capabilities, set the bar for innovation in war machines across the globe. Now, every military power with a submarine fleet harnesses the technology to accomplish what the Japanese envisioned years ago. Only now, with more powerful weaponry and with one main purpose, to inflict maximum damage to its enemy. It's hard to fathom what Japan's secret weapon would have accomplished if it was able to carry out its orders. The truth is, we will never know.